Uh, our first speaker will be Calder Allen. Um, I, it, it wouldn't be your fault if you don't know Calder. Uh, the Allens moved into our ward a while back. You heard from their other son, Grayson, uh, who recently uh, spoke as he was leaving on his mission. And Calder has returned from his, and we are excited to have him here in our ward for a short period of time. Uh, Calder served in the Mexico Pachuca mission uh, and will be sharing some, some thoughts from his mission, and uh, we welcome him home. Uh, following uh, Brother Allen, we will hear from Sister Chelsea Davis, uh, and we'll go to that point in our program. I called her. Okay. So yes, I am Calder Allen. Um, I'm originally from Washington, but happy to be here. I got back from my mission just a little bit over a month ago. Now, I want to preface my mission call to Mexico. I took French in high school for three years, and I really wanted to go to France. And if it wasn't France, I was okay with it, so long as it was French speaking. Canada, Africa, whatever, as long as I could continue to speak French. And I got my call, and I opened it up, and it says, Call to Brett Allen, you are hereby called to serve a mission for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And there's the hereby, you are hereby called to labor in the Mexico Pachuca mission. And my first thought was, that's not French. There's no way there's a French speaking mission in Mexico. And it was, it was Spanish. But I got to the MTC in Mexico City and I loved it. I loved it. I had a great companion, I had a great district, I had teachers and I decided that I was gonna love the language. And so I did, I learned Spanish. And I loved it. I didn't decide to love the people, but I couldn't help it. I got to the area and I started to meet people and I started to eat tacos <laughs> and all the rest of the wonderful food that's in Mexico. And I couldn't help it, I loved it. But it wasn't what I was expecting, which was a recurring thing throughout the past two years. It was never what I expected. I expected, once I was out of the MTC, to wake up at 6.30 every day, to get out the door at 10 o'clock, to come back 9 o'clock uh, from knocking doors. And I did my best to do those things, but my companion wasn't quite in that situation. We didn't always wake up early that first time around. I was unaware, but I did learn when you're in training, you have extra time to study and to pick up on things. And so we didn't always leave the door right in the morning. We usually left a little later, closer to the mid afternoon, because we were doing our studies. We came back earlier because it wasn't safe to be out after dark. And it wasn't what I was expecting. And I was really frustrated in those first two months because I felt like I wasn't becoming who I wanted to be and I felt like I wasn't doing what I wanted to be doing. I'm gonna share a quick story on this. I had heard before the mission from my dad and from other return missionaries and people that when you go on a mission, you have the spirit with you, as long as you're studying and doing what you should be doing, trying to be doing what you should be doing at least. And when you have that spirit, you can pray for it and you can pray for that guidance and we'll tell you where to go. And I'll tell you, go down this street, go down that street. There's a family over here you need to talk to. Go, and it'll help lead and guide you. And I thought, this is the coolest thing ever. It's like a superpower. And so maybe on my second week, I talked to my trainer, and I said, listen, I think we should do this. He wasn't a big fan of street contacting. But I said, we need, I think we should do this. Let's play follow the leader. And I said, one of us will go. We'll pray for the spirit and we'll go wherever it leads us. If it says go down that street, if it says talk to that person, we'll do it. We'll follow it and we'll just, we'll see what we can make happen. And he agreed. And so I said, do you want to go first? And he says, no. <laughs> so I went first. I prayed and attempted to follow the spirit. I went down different streets. I went up streets. I went back streets. Um, Another thing 
that's just interesting to know in Mexico, most of the streets don't have signs. They do have names, some of them. And a lot of houses don't have numbers. So when they give us addresses, instead of being a 149 East Street type thing, it's usually like the green one that's on the east side next to the main road. And you just go out and find it. <laughs> but anyways, I was trying to follow the spirit. And we walked around for 30, 40 minutes. And we weren't having much come of it. And so I turned to my companion. I said, okay, do you want to go? He says, yeah. And so he went. I says, do you want to pray? He says, no, I think we still have it. And I says, okay. And he walked home. And he fell asleep. <laughs> and I was like, what is going on? This is not what I expected. This is not what I thought I was going to be doing. They told me in the MTC, they ask, they say, who do you think your examples are when you're going out to serve a mission? Is it your parents? Is it your mission president? Is it your trainer? Is it your return missionaries you may have known? Hopefully all of those things, but the answer is none of them. They said, as a missionary, you only have one example. You follow the example of Jesus Christ. And no matter what happens, and no matter what happens when you go to your mission and when you start serving, focus on your Savior. And I thought, that sounds nice. <laughs> and I was in the MTC, and then when I was in the field, I had to apply it. And I learned more than anything throughout my whole mission to rely on Jesus. Now, I need to tell the next story so you don't think of my trainer as a bad missionary because he wasn't. He had a lot of good things. He did a lot of good things, and it'll make sense as I share this next story. Uh, at that time, it was before the pandemic, and so we were going and eating lunch just about every day with different members. And the tradition was that you would go and you have your lunch, and then you share scripture, and you try to have the members help you out a little bit, see who they know, or if you can help them or however, but you always share that scripture, you always share that thought. And uh, due to all my extra time, I was studying a lot. I read the whole Book of Mormon, and then some in those first two and a half months. And I always had something different for those meals. And I eventually learned that my companion was sharing the same thing every meal. He had the same scripture every time. Same words, same intro to it. And then something happened about, about a month into our time together. I think he decided that he didn't want to say, share the same scripture every time. And he saw what I was doing. And so he started studying in the mornings with me. And when the next meal came around, he shared a different scripture. And the next meal came around, and he had a different one. And he started saying, you know, I was studying this morning. And the Spirit impressed me with these different things. And he would share different things. And by the time that my time was over with him, I had really learned to love him. And we were doing good work. We were knocking. And we were. And I was getting to the point where I wanted to be. And then I got transferred. <laughs> I continued to serve in Mexico for six months. I was there for six months until the pandemic came. Now, you have to understand, as a missionary, you really don't know a lot of what happens in the world. You don't watch the news. You don't watch games. You don't, you don't have social media, at least not at that time we didn't. And so I had, I didn't even know COVID existed until a Wednesday when some rumors started to come down. Mexicans in the area were saying, you know, there's this COVID thing going up on in the States. I think they said that we think it's just because they have weak immune systems compared to us. We don't think anything's going to happen of it. 
And I said, I don't think so either. You know, I'm glad I'm down here right now. That was Wednesday. Friday, they called us and told you need to go into partial quarantine, which means you can go to appointments, but only when you set them up. Don't leave the house for any other reason. The next day, Saturday, they told us, drop everything you have. We're going to send you a list of supplies you need to buy for quarantine for your house, for full quarantine. So my companion and I, who at that time was the first American I had been with, went and we got our supplies and our quarantines and came back. They called us later that night and said, what's your home airport? Tuesday, I was in my bed. That was not what I expected. <laughs> it never was. Now you'd think I had learned, you'd think I would have learned that I shouldn't expect certain missions or I shouldn't hope for certain missions. At this time, they said, we're gonna reassign you. And I thought, here's my chance to go French speaking. I'm gonna go to Louisiana. I'm gonna be speaking French. I said, here it came. I didn't get it the first round, but that's okay. This is why this happened. Now I'm gonna speak French. Well, I got called, reassigned to serve in the Idaho, Idaho Falls mission. And if you don't know where that is, I'm guessing you don't have pioneer ancestors. <laughs> it's about four hours from here. And it was Spanish speaking. And I said, well, okay. You know, I'm the, you know, I still love Spanish speaking. And I got there and I loved it too. I was very blessed. I had a companion, my first companion there. Well, I, I was shuffled around for a few weeks, but my first real companion was native to Venezuela. And all we did was speak Spanish. And he taught me so much. And I began to feel like finally, I'm really getting into this work. <laughs> I'm really becoming who I wanted to be. And now I wanna say a side note on this that's a little bit out of chronological order, but I was promised in various blessings before the mission that I would serve as a leader in my mission. Now, I wouldn't say that I was a power hungry person. I wouldn't say that I ever was very anxious to be a leader, but I thought it's always happened. I was leader in younger meetings. I was leader in other things. I figured it'll just keep coming that way. It's just, that's, that's where I go. And it says right here that I'll be a leader. I was never called as district leader, as zone leader, as assistant. I was never called in any leadership position. And it didn't bother me not to be a leader, but I began to wonder what's going on with this blessing because it says, it says pretty clearly <laughs> and it's not happening. So I went back and I looked at it closer. It, it didn't say you will be a leader in your mission. It said you will become a leader. Once I figured that out, my whole perspective and the work changed. It wasn't about being there and getting it right the first day or the second or the third or however long it took. It wasn't about hitting all the numbers perfectly. It wasn't about any of those things. It was about becoming something. Becoming more like my savior. So I wanna share the next part. <clears throat> Being in Idaho Falls, the biggest thing I think I learned. And this was something that wasn't in the moment. It was something that I've looked at. The more and more I look back at the letters I sent home at my journal entries and different things, there was one recurring theme in Idaho Falls. And it was, don't believe the rumors. Don't prejudice, don't prejudge. Because you hear a lot of things about the area, about certain families that you're teaching, 
about companions that are coming in. And it's easy when you get called and, and switch to a new area. I got sent to Chalice, which was one of my areas, which is one of my, it was maybe my favorite area, but it's right up in the edge of the Frank Church Wilderness, up by Stanley and Redfish Lake, some of you might know. In Chalice, there's about a thousand people. We covered a valley next to us of about a hundred people. And then the other valley, which had a city of seven people. And Stanley, which had maybe 50. And they said, nobody baptizes there. Nothing ever happens there. It's, it's empty. It's, it is the boonies. They say, you drive out into the wilderness about an hour to the middle of nowhere. You go another hour. You go another hour. You go another one, and you're in chalice. And I loved it. And it wasn't <laughs> what I expected, but we did. I like to say we baptized half a town. Because we did baptize half of the town with the seven people population. <laughs> and it was awesome. But the point was, I learned that you just, you can't ever say an area was dead. And you couldn't ever say that's not a good companion. One of my companions kind of was at odds with another guy that I was called to serve with. And I thought, oh no. I don't want to be with this guy because all I'd heard were bad things from about him from other missionaries. But I said, I, I guess we'll keep an open mind. We'll see. And he has turned out to be one of my best friends. He's going to BYU with me. I still hang out with him. He's awesome. The point was, people say things. They say, we've always done it this way. This is the way it is. This is who I am. And it never has to be true. The power of the atonement of Jesus Christ is change. And I've seen it. I saw it in the lives of people I was teaching. People who left addictions. People who got married. People who came back to church so they could baptize their kids. I saw in the lives of my companions who turned around, who began to study, who began to follow the Spirit. And I saw it in myself. I don't know what I thought I would have at the end of my mission. Memorize the first vision. Know the scriptures better. Feel comfortable talking to people. There are things I thought I had. Things I do have. But there's no way. I could have anticipated. What I've learned. About my savior. And how much I need him. Uh, finish with one last story. I got to go back to Mexico. And at this point, I was thinking, you know, it wouldn't be so bad to stay in Idaho Falls. I was really loving it there. But it was really cold. And I knew Mexico was going to be nice and warm. It was March. And it was still snowing in Idaho. And I'd look at the forecast for Mexico and it'd say 79, 78, 83. I thought that sounds okay. I got I sent I was sent back. And in the last two transfers, the last three months, I was called to train. And I had a brand new missionary. And I told him, I said, if you ever feel that the spirit wants to lead you one way or the other, stop your bike and tell me. And we'll go. And we did. And I did get that experience. We did follow and found the people. There was a point where we needed to find new housing. And it was, it was like having a compass in your head. It just says, 
this street, that street, go back, you missed a turn, down here, and we got the housing, and we found different people to baptize. And I was able to tell him, I hope I've done well, but I'm not your example. You have only one example. That is your savior. Love the people. Love the work. You have to learn to love yourself too. And follow the spirit. The mission was not what I expected. And I'm grateful for it. I'd like to share my testimony. Um, and I'll do it in Spanish. I'm not going to do it in French. <laughs> sé que Dios es mi Padre Celestial y que me ama, que me conoce personalmente. Es algo que siempre lo he supuesto. Sé que me conoce más que nadie y que puedo confiar en Él. He aprendido cómo comunicarme con Él a través del Espíritu Santo. Sé que el libro de Mormón es la palabra de Dios y que contiene el Evangelio en su plenitud, que contiene las respuestas por cualquier pregunta que quizás tiene. Gracias a eso, sé que José Smith es un profeta, fue y es un profeta de la iglesia de Dios. No una iglesia de hombre, ni una iglesia de organización, ni cualquier cosa así, sino de nuestro Dios. Sé que el Espíritu Santo es la medida por la cual podemos comunicarnos con nuestro Padre Celestial y aprender de él. Podemos recibir consuelo, fuerza y guía por medio de él. Y sé, sobre todo, que Jesucristo es mi Redentor y Salvador. Y que gracias a él, tengo una oportunidad. Y tengo nuevas oportunidades cada día a empezar de nuevo. A acercarme más a él. Y a ser más como Él. A amar a mi prójimo y amar a mi Señor. Esas cosas lo testifico y lo comparto en el nombre de Jesucristo. Amén.